pleasure to, uh, to light today to welcome Dr. Wong Chin Wan. Uh, Dr. Wong is a distinguished political scientist and public intellectual, and also a prominent <coughs> and courageous political activist in Malaysia. He's a fellow and the head of the political and social analysis section at the Penang Institute in Malaysia, which is a main state government uh, think tank. Dr. Wong's academic training was completed at the University of Essex, where he wrote a doctoral dissertation analysing the relationship between the electoral and party systems in West Malaysia. Since then, he has published extensively on Malaysian politics and more broadly, including on the electoral one-party state, federalism, parliamentary democracy, differentiated citizenship, ethnic tensions, and political Islam. Dr. Wong's publications on Malaysian politics are indispensable to any serious student of that country's regime and its dynamics. <coughs> a particularly important conjuncture uh, uh, between Dr. Wong's academic, uh, public intellectual and, act and uh, activist work involves his detailed and authoritative studies into the malapportionment and gerrymandering of constituencies in that country. And through his involvement in the electoral reform movement Verse, assisting citizens to challenge such malpractices via administrative and legal challenges. Verse has faced various forms of intimidation from authorities, including the use of water cannon and tear gas at its public demonstrations. Dr. Wong regularly writes political commentaries and opinion pieces in English, Malay, and Chinese language newspapers in Malaysia. Given Dr. Wong's reputation and profile, and what is happening in Malaysian politics at this very time, he is in big demand as a speaker, so I'm most grateful that he has made the journey to Perth to address us today. The Australian media, not least through the 28th of March ABC Four Corners program, State of Fear, Murder and Money in Malaysia, has conveyed something of the seriousness of the current controversy uh, that embroils Prime Minister uh, Najib Razak at the moment. Today, Dr. Wong will now offer his analysis on what this controversy means and where it may be headed under the seminar title, Najib Razak's Resilience and Malaysia's Collective Action Problems. Welcome again and uh, over to you, Jim Wai. Thank you. So in that very ironical sense, Nanjib and Amno of the end are actually the minimum uh, common denominators in the fragmented party federation. It doesn't sound some things uh, what you would normally hear from uh, the opposition, some people who are critics of the government. But I think that's the reality that we face. We have a divided nation. Uh, and people simply cannot bring together, bring themselves together to replace uh, an unpopular leader. So, uh, I mean, my collective action first is a question of like, who to bear the cat? People in Amu wants to replace him. I think uh, three years ago, if you look at the uh, general elections 2013, Najib was actually more popular than his party. So the party depended on him somewhat to carry. But today, he's clearly less popular than his party. So it doesn't make sense for the party to keep him. Uh, we had a bit of discussions on Australian politics just before this. I was asking about you know, uh, why the Liberals and the Labour in, in Australia would change the prime minister so frequently. The main reason is because 
is that we are responding to the electoral prospect. When the Prime Minister cannot deliver votes in the coming election, then it's only rational for you to remove the Prime Minister, the party leader. But in the case of Malaysia, we are exactly, we're supposed to be a Westminster parliamentary system. But our system could not remove that. And, and part of the reason is like looking from, if you look at Amnon, I mean, when we talk about VIA, it's actually looking from the main party. How do you get, how do you bring down magic without yourself being hurt? Now, at the moment, you see uh, Mahathir. Uh, the former Prime Minister who was in power for 23 years, his son, Muhyiddin Shafi'i, uh, a few others, party leaders, uh, who are opposing him. They are all shouting, but no one is charging. No one is seriously charging into Najib's ground. Has any one of the key leaders been charging they would have been sacked by the party, right? Because Najib would not be kind to them. So why is it that no one, including, let's say, Mukris, why, why doesn't he push it until he gets sacked? The whole idea is that the Amnu rebels basically is hoping for a meltdown in Amnu that they can take over <coughs> without paying the price of being sacked. It's it's a calculation everyone knows in the party. Someone got the charge before Najib get pulled up. But whoever goes first, you would you would have your, your head charged. So you want to you, you're hoping that other people will do the job for you. Think of this way, if you really have a change in party leadership, the the last person who defect from Najib Khan may be actually more appreciated than the first rebels who fire the show. Because the first guy probably would be killed first, and his body would be stacked over, and they may not remember him. But the last person who was instrumental enough to defect at last minute and install a new government, a new prime minister, that person probably would, would, would be in the best position to extract a lot of, uh, of benefits. So you're having a situation here that uh, the game is not really old, it's not really, has not really started uh, to me until, for example, say, Mahathir Sadhu creates the sack. Because it's not a real war, it's just a shopping match now. No one wants to pay the price. And the very reason why no one wants to pay the price, if you compare to uh, a standard parliamentary system, is because that the price to challenge the party leadership has become so uh, corrosive that you're going to lose everything before it works. So the positions of Abnu presidency or the prime ministership is like a castle that is easy to defend but hard to conquer. Whoever gets in there, you'll be protected by the system. So unless you are the former prime minister, Abdullah Badawi, who basically did not have uh, did not have the spirit to fight at his surrender. Otherwise, anyone who's there, you can you can actually stay on until the system breaks you down. And the whole question here is that what would be the last straw that breaks the camel back? So that's the question of so like everyone who say, well, uh, either openly or secretly and say this may not be good for them to, for up to the next election. But who is there to actually open each other quickly? And the price that you have to pay, you can look at what Mahathir himself suffered, could I put? Um, he, was, he was terminated from his position as Petronas, the petroleum company, National Petroleum Company's uh, advisor. And uh, he later resigned uh, from the National Car Company, and together with another three positions. But his resignation is interesting. It's not so much that because uh, I think that he wanted to let go, but it was made clear to him that if he were to stay on as the chairman of Proton, then Proton, the company, will be cut uh, 
support. <coughs> and then without the money, protons rank and file will rise against Mahadev. So it's better for Mahadev to actually step down and resign and looks that it, instead of taking the cumulation data. Now, uh, the second collision problem, say the second collective action problem, is the idea of like, what to do. I mean, it's going beyond Amnion, going beyond the yeah. uh, What do you have in place after that? It's a collision against rather than a collision for. So in that sense, the collision we have today, uh, the empty Najib collision today, is, is less uh, solid than whatever opposition collision they had in the past. Because in the past, they at least came up with some sort of common manifesto. So they have some common decision. They would have a common uh, candidate for prime minister. The only thing that they would have they, they, they have avoided, they have avoided the parts for all the opposition relations are two issues. One is Islamization. Second is on the future of the new economic policy. These are the two things that the opposition relations in the past have never been able to come down to concrete uh, solution. Beyond that, they generally agree. And this is not what you find at the moment the anti Najib collision. Because they could not agree on almost everything except that Najib was good. Now, if you look back to the system that we have, is, uh, this is a Prime Minister, a uh, Westminster system. Uh, a Westminster Prime Minister will be checked by uh, at different levels. So at first, you would have to face the electoral rate. And because the fear of losing elections, that even public protest, uh, will be enough to constrain you. Next to it, of course, that uh, in between elections, you have you, you are subject to the threat of no confidence vote in the army. Now, beyond that, in, in a proper Westminster system, you the prime minister is just the first among equals. In, in, in the parliamentary parties. So your party could actually bring you down without going through a general election. There was a case of uh, Margaret Thatcher in the UK. He, she was subjected to both a word of confidence in the parliament and a leadership challenge in her party. She survived the word of confidence intact. There's not a single conservative parliamentarian who voted against her who voted in favour of the no confidence motion. However, in her party election, she failed uh, to garner enough work to avoid the second round. And for that, she sat down. And, I mean, before that, you could actually have uh, resignations of the front batch, which would embarrass <coughs> uh, the Prime Minister, uh, also signal that who would be likely the contender to your post. So all these things make actually a, a parliamentary system very flexible, that you could actually avoid political crisis <coughs> as compared to a presidential system. Because the presidential system would have the head of government, which is the head of state, directly elected. And then you have your legislation also directly elected. And therefore, you could end up in either, uh, you know, still make a divided government in, in American case. You, you can have a very unpopular prime minister, uh, uh, president staying on, drag it all the way until the terms end. But this is not the case that's supposed to happen in a parliamentary system. So it becomes more interesting to look at and say, what's wrong with the Malaysian system? Because we should have resolved this. I mean, how many countries could actually you know, appear on international media headlines like every other two weeks for corruption. Malaysia is doing that. And the entire system is, is hopeless in dealing with it. And part of the reason is because that we, if you look at this, because that look from the top, the elections are not free and fair. 
So the government is actually protected. You do not feel that you're going to lose it for sure. And then the parliament is so weakened that a vote of no confidence was, treat, was, uh, was treated as a criminal offence by the Inspector General of Police. He saw that as an act of treason. I mean, he didn't use the word treason. But he basically saw this uh, you know, subverting government illegally. And you have this, this notion going around that say, because we are a democracy, therefore a democratically elected government should be allowed to go on a full term. <coughs> that line of argument can only work legitimately in a presidential system, not a parliamentary one. And, and, and more important is that we do not have anything close to a par parliamentary uh, caucus. We do not have anything like a party room in Australia. Whether uh, from just the lower house or the upper house, we do not have anything. And the Prime Minister, therefore, is not the first amongst equal of his or her cabinet or parliamentary peers, colleagues. But rather, he was the one who actually controlled uh, his party because he's elected uh, by the party representative. In, in a name, it looks more democratic because that thousands of people would put him into power in his party and should that control the government. But in reality, because that the elites are so controlled that the Prime Minister, as the party president, control uh, the nominations of candidates. So power is actually concentrated in this way. And therefore, that's, that's explained why people are not bold enough to come out and challenge him, even though it's so clear now that he's going to be a liability of his party. He's already a liability to his party in the election. And uh, what could be worse is that in the middle of the election, he could be actually prosecuted by any, not by Malaysian authority, but it could be from any other country. Could be from Switzerland, could be from the suburbs and so on. How can you win an election when your prime minister is, is charged in the country? But all these things do not come into the consideration of the party because of the collective action problem. It's individually irrational for you to charge <laughs> and bring down the government. And bring down the prime minister because you punish us. You'll be cut off from whatever position you have. Your loans will be pulled back. You'll be denied contract. Uh, some prosecution may be, uh, may be found against you. So the party is captured. And going beyond the party, then the larger question is that people cannot agree on how the country should be after Najib. And because that you cannot remove Amno, so removing Najib then would mean a different configuration where Arno at best would be only part of the player, no longer the community player. And because there's no national consensus on that, we are stuck. So if you think that on the surface that relations are, are cowards because that we, you know, it's business as usual no matter what happened in the world, no matter how we look at us, we, we go on our life. And that's really another way to look at it is because that Malaysians don't, no matter conscious or not, they are not going for a, a situation like Egypt, where you can bring down the government, but you may not have anything concrete, sustainable to offer. The solution that Malaysia may need is one like Tunisia. You need a con national consensus to move on, but that has yet to happen. So now look back at the, <coughs> What created the system? So, instead of uh, the main line that people like Dr. Mahathir is propagating, is that logic is the main reason that why everything goes wrong. He is the cause. I would argue and say he is just a symptom. He perfects the flaws of the system. And who made the system? The system actually has two parts. One is Najib's biological fathers. That's Rasa, 
to Nadirasa, the second prime minister. In 1969, he built an electoral one party state in response to a riot that happened after an electoral setback to the ruling coalition. With that, he locked in the majority voters. And as part of the post-1969 order, he removed any constitutional constraint on male apportionment so that allowed Amnu to amplify his electoral strength. He, am he amended the Sedition Act to basically rule out questionings of constitutional, for constitutional matters, include, especially by uh, including uh, the special positions of the Malays and the East Malaysian natives, which was used beyond the original constitutional provision as the justification for the new economic policy paradigm, or the booming tribalism, nativism paradigm. Uh, he weakened the parliament by electoral one party state. I meant that this is a situation where the state party boundary is consciously blurred. So when you are opposing the government, you are seen as you are opposing the country. In that sense, I would argue and say uh, that one key difference between Malaysia and, say, the People's Republic of China is that Communist China is much more honest. They don't pretend to be a democracy when they are not. We do. And I'll come to that part uh, very quickly. The other part, the other father of the system is Mahathir himself. The main critics of Najib today and the backers of Najib until two, three years ago by uh, his economic policy, industrialization, privatization. He opened the door for money politics in Amnu. He purged a persecuted party descendants from Tibur Razali to Anwar Ibrahim and so on. Uh, he destroyed the, the judicial, uh, he's destroyed judicial independence. And today, interestingly, he's filing suits uh, to freeze magic assets, which can theoretically work only if you have a judicial independence. Uh, he wasn't the politici politicizing of the police. <coughs> he wasn't control of media. I, I, I use the word person because all these things did not start in the Mahali. But it picked under Mahali. And a bit of that will actually roll back uh, during the, the time of Abdullah Badawi, the Prime Minister before Najib. Najib was put in place partly by, by supported by, by Mahathir and uh, the right, the ultra right factions of Amnu, because Abdullah was seen as being too soft. And it was Mahathir's legacy to call up Islamists to strengthen Amnu. A strategy which Najib is using very effectively today. Najib has just met the controversial uh, preacher from India, Zakti Naik, who was barred from the uh, UK and a few other countries for, for, for justifying terrorism. And uh, Mahathir concentrated power from cabinet to the Prime Minister office. Uh, the Prime Minister of his today have, has 10 ministers without portfolio. <coughs> One shot of forming a football team. <laughs> and he started the tradition of holding finance ministerial portfolio as well. And that's a key thing because without, without this practice, Najib would not be in the direct position to authorize all the decisions of what MDB. All this were not discussed in Mahathir's rhetorics. Because what he wants, what he wants Malaysians to believe is that Najib's personality trait, or I believe his wife's, 
are the reason that why we have all this, we, we landed ourselves in this trouble. Now this is Razak's quote. The view we take is that democratic government is the best and most acceptable form of government. So long as the form is preserved, the substance can be changed to suit conditions of a particular country. He said this after the change in 1969. And he said it to the Commonwealth parliamentarians in their Congress. And that's where I think that Rasa was one of the smartest politicians of his time. Not only in Malaysia, but in the third world. Because if you look at Zambia, two years after 1969, what happened in Malaysia, Zambia ruling party suffered a number of by-election defeats. It's not even a general election. And the ruling party responded by officially demolishing multi-party democracy. And because the end to multi-party <coughs> democracy was explicit, that was reversed in 1990, when one-party states collapsed throughout the world. In Malaysia, it survived, because it was never put in such explicit way. I think this is something that people where criticals of the system need to recognize the system is very sophisticated. And uh, his argument to that was saying that in our Malaysian society of today, where racial manifestations are very much in exercise, any form of politicking is bound to follow racial lines and we only enhance the divisive tendencies among our people. <coughs> he said on the occasion, to justify that why Democracy, fundamentally, is not suitable for a country like Malaysia because we are multicultural. That diversity and democracy do not go hand in hand. These are the deeper questions that we have to face. We were never a democracy, at least from 1969, that we claim to be. And I would argue and say, the crisis we are in is a natural outcome of the logics that have been underlying in the operation of the system. It's inevitable as if like the collapse of the Soviet Union at the end of the 80s, after its earlier success, you can't look back and say, no, Soviet Union collapsed because of Russia. That's not because so much of the person. It's a logic of the system. This is something that's important to look back. I, I mentioned just now, I say that Raza, Ajit's father, built a system to lock in the, the Malay votes. This is a fact that uh, escaped attention of most Malaysians, including scholars. The story we knew about the 1969 election, which preceded the ethnic writer, which then visited the party state. The story we were told was that the minority non malays Chinese especially, deserted the ruling coalition, and therefore in response, you had the right. The story I want to show you here is based on electoral data. We would never be able to be certain of how each ethnic group voted in the election because there's no way for us to trace back. Ballot secrecy is largely, is largely intact. However, you can read from proxies. So you can look at the parties and look at which, where do they draw their support from, and then you come to the conclusion and say, where do they actually, uh, how likely which ethnic, ethnic, ethnic group has voted? The one, the two bars, uh, the blue bars up there are the changes in wood shed. The red bars are the changes in 
phthalic acid share in phthalic. So what we normally get the impression is that it was a Malay tsunami, but it was a Chinese tsunami, if you like, to use a post-2008 metaphor, is because that the non-Malay based opposition <coughs> had their seats increased from <coughs> 6 to 25, almost four times. That was the reason. While Malay opposition, uh, Malay based opposition, had a much more smaller increase from 9 to 12. One term. But if you look at the wood share, this is basically just based on the peninsula, <coughs> West Malaysia, for two reasons. There was no elections in 1964 for Sabah and Sarawak, so you can't do a comparison. Secondly, the electoral context is very different. Amnon was actually just a peninsula. The alliance that we knew was only a peninsula. So for that reason, the comparison can only be made between peninsula and uh, uh, between 64 and 69. Now you look at that, a lion lost about 10% of votes. And a non-Malay based opposition, by non-Malay based opposition, we are not talking about exactly the same party because party labor changed tremendously. Registered almost zero increase. What was the mean change in 1969? It was about 10% wood shifting from alliance to the Malay based opposition. 9% point of that went to parts. If we study Amnu to pass wood share in 1964, it was 5 to 2. That ratio went down to a stuck in 3 to 2 by 1969. What we are seeing in 1969 was the emergence of a two party dynamics in Malay politics. That has a threatening effect to the entire system because the ground rule of Malayan politics then was that Malay. The Malays had to be dominant. The 1969 election outcome put a new sentence there. Yes, Malay must be dominant, but it need not be unknown. The non-Malay opposition could have just worked with us. And if they were to come together and form a coalition, you would have a two-party system as early as the 70s. That is a fundamental challenge of a new nation. I'm not going in to speculate what caused the riot. But what I wanted to say is that if you believe that politicians are rational, that what happened after the election, the only way out for Amnu would be to lock in the Malay voters. And the riot, and the emergency rule post riot, takes the way to that. That's the situation we're in. So I'm going to make that choice in response to the Tunku Rebellion, which failed to gain, to, to come to, to uh, Sustain the lay support. There was no choice in 1969, after 1969. Almost disastrous in multi party, multi -party competition, Amnu opted for one party state with elections. The challenge we have here, going back to the collective action, is that there was no choice. After that, that's a larger question that we need to ask, and I think that is under discussed in the nation. What's what's under choice? The picture on top left was my into the outward.
Norway presidents of Taiwan. KMT, the old grand old party of Taiwan, lost its power in 2000. Ma came back in 2008 and survived. I mean, he got, he got re elected in 2012. So KMT came back after losing. The second picture was PRI in Mexico. They lost in 2000. And then they came back in 2012. The picture down there was Goka in Indonesia. Goka was part of uh, Suharto's ruling regime. But slightly different, <coughs> Suharto's Indonesia is different from KMT's Taiwan and uh, PRI's Mexico. But the first Taiwan and Mexico were actually electoral one party states. It's a party to control the system. In the case of Indonesia, it's actually an electoral dictatorship. So it was personal power. And Goka, nevertheless, was, was instrumental in that. Then the other two differences between Mexico and Taiwan from Indonesia is that in Taiwan and Mexico, the ruling parties were engaging. They, they were part of the transformation. They manage the transformation before they defeat. While in the case of Goka, Goka never wanted or never in a position to push for anything. So how the regime just collapsed. But the common things of this is that this party all came back. So while they were authoritarian party, dominant party during uh, the authoritarian time, they managed to transform themselves into democratically competitive party. So the question to Amnu is that, can Amnu ever do that? Because now we are redefining what we mean by transition in Malaysia to put into context of this Mahathir black coalition. Because until the emergence of this, this coalition, transition in Malaysia if you look at the language of the opposition, this means the end of Amnu, Amnu out of power. Right? But with Mahathir coming into the picture, with Mahathir and, and, Mahathir and uh, Amnu rebels coming into the picture, you can't define transition as the same. The transition then means that you have a multi party system, a genuinely multi party, uh, competitive multi party <coughs> system. Uh, yet, yeah, Amnu is still in power. That's the situation as if Taiwan from 1992 to 2000 would be a transition before you have full transition. Now, but would Amnu go for that path? For Amnu to go for that path, we need institutional reform. But this is what is missing from Mahathir's language. Uh, Rafizi, uh, PKR Lawman was arrested under the Official Secret Act. I questioned Mahathir in one of his public forums and said that uh, the new ally is now arrested under OSA. Are you going to oppose OSA for his sake? Because if you're not going to do that, why should I trust you that you would have any commitment for institutional reforms? Because the term institutional reforms covers so many things. Of course, there are many things that you may not agree. But this is a very clear cut case. If you are not going to oppose OSA, how can I trust you that you would actually hope for a different Malaysia after removing Najib? And not just because that Najib was the corrupt prime minister that you don't like. And his answer was uh, we can't talk about removing, uh, we can't talk about institutional reform in details because that we will start following and we will not be united to gather our strength together to up Najib. So what we need to then is to uh, is to up Najib first. So the way for me, for Mahathir to to support or to defend uh, Rafizi is to bring down Najib. <coughs> that was the slide. Now I want to show you 
Uh, but I think going back to the larger questions of all this is uh, it's, it's a fundamental question of nationhood and citizen that we were stuck since 1946. That was immediately after the war, the British came back, they introduced the Malayan Union, which was a unitary state, but with liberal citizenship arrangement for the, non, for the minorities. That was objected by the Malays and which gave birth to UMNO. And basically all our history, I'm not going to give you to that, but all our history going back to that. And if you like, that question can be summarized that can citizens be different than equal? If the answer is yes, means that you don't have to share uh, the same language, the same religion, and yet you should be politically equal. If the answer is no, then you have to you can't talk about equality without assimilation. And Malaysian politics specifically have never gone beyond that. So the picture on the left was in 1946. If you read that, there were some things to say that Malaya for Malays. Now, on the right was a picture in maybe about three years or two years ago, a group called Isma, and that little cute, that, that cute little boy had it on his banner Islam, the land, this land is the land of Malay Islam. That's the deeper question that we are stuck. Because you cannot agree on, and therefore, if you if you are hoping for a certain change, it probably not going to be Tunisia. It's more likely to be Egypt. So I'll go very quickly on this step to summarize what I say. Uh, it just basically transition the pathway. So this is a larger picture we look at after two after GE14. Uh, Najib stepped down because uh, the, the, the one on the left is that whether Najib stepped down before GE14 or stayed on until GE14. Then the next question is whether you have decision reform or no decision reform. And then after that, whether or no uh, BM wins the next GE elections, right? This is probably most uh, pro-democracy relations one. Means that nothing stepped down before G14, and you managed to get institutional reforms. And following that, Amno loses elections because it was not competitive, not transform enough. Uh, and you have multi-party democracy with party automation. Clear that place. I think this would be acceptable if that is stepped down, you have institutional reform, but I'm going to still win this election because of uh, anglo nationalism. So then what you have is multi party democracy without party automation. Now, doing nothing means that Najib stepped down, I stay on until G14, then uh, the best option, the best scenario then would be say, because the legend is so corrupt, I'm going to lose the next election, and then you have party automation. You notice I do not put multi-party democracy there, because that party, party automation alone does not guarantee that you're going to have institutional reform. The system is so good for any winner. Why would they want to change it? But it could also lead to transition and chaos, because I'm may not want to accept the outcome. Or it could actually, I'm going to win, and then you have one party state. The worst outcome, however, to me, is that Najib stepped down before GE14, and there's no institutional reform, and Amnon wins the elections, and when that happens, you can expect that it's likely going to be another minority rule, and therefore Amnon would have to be very authoritarian to survive the <coughs> To me, that's a, that's a scenario, and that's, it's not hard to imagine. Think of a peace deal before Mahathir. Uh, between Mahathir and Najib Loyalis, for example, you have a lineup of Zahid Hamidi, Prime Minister, uh, Shamuddin <coughs> Hussein as Deputy Prime Minister, Mukris appointed as Senator and take over a key minister in his position as number three. That's a united Amna. And that's enough to bring some sense of direction to Malaysians who are so traumatized by all these rapid changes. This is 
a close-up on that to go on just before the interview, what could then lead to Najib staying on power or not? One is, sorry, let's go back to this. One is foreign prosecution. The other one is public discontent. The third one is people power. I mean, by that I mean that, you know, street protests that eventually have a rise system. Of these three, I think the most likely one is foreign prosecution. Mahathir was right in the sense to say that he when he asked for foreign intervention. Because the moment you have you have prime minister that is persecuted by a foreign country, it's hard for, uh, for the system to deny that say this is just business as usual. You can't. Because you're likely to lose the election, right? Public discontent is what's going on that people hope they say, if it enough of us show that we are not happy, then people in Amno would get a signal and overcome the collective action problem because the cost would be so low, the benefit would be much higher, and therefore you can push through. And of course, if things go wrong, uh, you know, something stupid happens, you could end up have people's power by accident. So what happened that then next? Then you could have the options of Amno say on not just say on power. And then no decision reform then G14. It could have been Amnu had a peace plan, not just ousted, and new Amnu Prime Minister. Yes, with or without decision reform, or you could actually have a transitional government because the Amnu could not make up its mind as a bloc. So you actually have defections, a part of Amnu. And then this part of Amnu join force with the opposition and therefore you have a transitional government and hopefully then you have transitional, you have decision reform. So what's the best option? The best option would have been this. Public discontent, you go through UMNO uh, defections, you have a transitional government, you have institutional reform, then you go to G14. This is doing nothing. UMNO say, let you stay in power, no institutional reform, you go to G14. This could be the worst. You have public discontent, UMNO peace plan, new UMNO prime minister, no institutional reform, G14. This is basically the last, this last one is basically a zooming in of the previous slide. So that's that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. It's time for questions and we emphasize questions rather than policy statements. Uh, so if you can put your questions and just indicate who you are as a courtesy to uh, our guest. Thank you very much. Ben. Hello, uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, um, sorry, who are you? Oh, uh, Ben Riley, the Walton Murdoch School, Murdoch University. Um, You're Ben Riley? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> As you uh, to the <laughs> I read his book for my PhD. <laughs> yeah, yes, why? The electoral system. Yes, yeah, that's right. So th I really enjoyed that. Um, and I think you're right to frame this as a collective action problem. That makes a lot of sense. We were just chatting actually before this seminar about well, why don't why doesn't the parliament just, you know, have a no-confidence motion or something? But um, <clears throat> my question is, you, at the end you talked about institutional reform as this sort of linchpin for the whole thing, but you didn't say what kind of institutional reforms... I mean, is it just the gerrymandering and the sedition act, or are we talking about, you know, a, a bigger redesign of the political architecture of Malaysia? What, what, what sort of reforms would be required to, to create a vital democracy? Um, we basically can look at it in, in different ways. Some people who want a very minimalist one is probably a Singaporean model. This means that you focus on good governance. Uh, that reform would probably cover uh, the Attorney General's chamber, the police, the, uh, anti corruption commissions, and so on. And that's end that, right? If you go the next step, then you would have to bring in about democratic, beyond good governance, you have to look at the democratic process. So I think that's why it's important is that you have to talk about uh, electoral reform itself, you have to talk about uh, parliamentary reform, because, uh, and going beyond what people talk about now of setting up committees, uh, cutting the powers of the speaker, I think what is important is to bring in parliamentary party. That's essentially to, to cut the power a prime minister as party leader vis-a-vis his or her colleagues. There's some things that no one wants to talk about, including the opposition party, because that would actually shake, shake up the system. Uh, 
But beyond this part, I think the other thing we want to talk about, to talk about is what kind of social environment that would allow democracy to function. So we need to affirm the right to dissent. That's a challenge to the system, to, to the society, because that really is actually quite authoritarian. We think that dissent is dangerous. Diversity is dangerous. So to deal with dissent, you have to, uh, you have to uh, abolish a lot of this draconian laws. But to deal with diversity, let's go beyond political institution. That's really coming back to say, how do we shape the future? So in my words, is that how do we answer the 1946 question? It's, it's all questions from, uh, from an imperfect formula of decolonization. It sat there for so long, but eventually it comes back to haunt us. And we, I don't think we can postpone. And for that reason, I'm actually quite patient. I've been being Malaysian today. You have one disadvantage. It's like you have international friends asking you, how can you guys live as business as usual? When your prime minister is such a national shame, yes. And many, many of many Malaysians really cannot live with that, and they feel they feel compelled to act. But for me, I think that we have to accept that it's probably a collective karma. Unless you deal with the deeper questions, you are not going to find a quick solution. A quick solution may not be the best solution. So, you know, surviving for so long, I can do it. Thanks, Ben. Jim? Um, I'm Jim Baxter, representing the Australian Institute of International Affairs. I'm just wondering what your figures there. To what extent is the electorate now increasingly uh, of a younger age group? And does that younger age group kind of follow the traditional UNO uh, concept? Right. Okay. I, 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 offhand, I don't have the figures of, of uh, growing uh, percentage of, of younger voters, but it's certainly on the rise. And that's actually a, a good question here. Uh, with the campaign to get more voters registered, you have, uh, you have that profile going down. So to be hope, to be positive, then you would have to think and say, now this likely is going to push for changes and so on. Um, but more realistically speaking, I think there are actually two forces pulling things. One is uh, more the economic questions because that. Many young people, including in the Malay, uh, Malay Muslim categories, are not benefiting from the economy. So you have more taxes, you have stagnant income, you have influx of foreign labor to take up the lower levels of jobs and so on. Uh, so there's an incentive for people to vote at least in protest. But on the other part, that is where when you come, you look at identity politics. And that's the part that I'm not sure whether we can be completely optimistic. Because the signals are mixed. On one hand, you have more people uh, seeing the fact and say, we are living together for so long, uh, there's no way that you can, you can think of uh, divorce or separations, you know, or any cleansing so whatsoever. So you, we need to be realistic and we need to be accommodative. So in that sense, that would lead people, the young people, to vote for something workable. On the other hand, you probably, at the same time, because how the one party seems have failed, and I would call it a one party state rather than a full fledged ethnocracy, because an ethnocracy would then should be blind a partisanship, and therefore over time, all Malays would have been helped either on the ground of meritocracy or on the grounds of needs. But that didn't happen. It was a party state, which means that the benefits go out looking at connections, loyalty. How close are you to the system? Uh, not just the party, sometimes the factions, right? Family names, uh, old boys, old girls, connections, and whatsoever. So as an outcome of that, you actually have Malay anxiety today that is economically driven on one hand but is tied up to the identity aspects of Malaysian politics. The system had not been very successful. 
has been successful in the sense to close the gap. So in general, you compare Malaysia today that four decades ago, you have fewer poorer Malays. That's obvious, and it's an achievement that we all should celebrate. However, if you look at ordinary people, either in the lower class below, you look at social mobility, I would say that most Malaysians would agree with me that the Chinese and the Indian, despite state policy disfavoring them, actually have better prospect than the Malays. And this is the part where you get stuck. I think two years, uh, yet last year, there was a, there was a law graduate, uh, I don't remember her name now, uh, she stayed in the public forums and that, that her video went viral. She was a law graduate and she said that, you know, uh, with my law degree, I supposed to be in middle class, but then I do not have enough money to survive. So by end of the month, I, I, I could not afford to buy my car, I had to rent it from my father. And by end of the month, I was quick driving because I didn't have money for petrol, so I take public transport. And, and she asked and said, if this is my case, what about the others? That was me last year. And someday about the same time, you have two incidents of uh, uh, I guess that's how you see it, whether it's, it's consumer <coughs> trader conflicts or communal conflicts uh, involving mobile phone. So you have uh, Malay patrons who were accused of robbing, sorry, uh, stealing, and then uh, they beat up the Chinese traders. In another case, it was probably more clear cut. In the, in the first case, it was actually a theft. It turned out to be almost confirmed as a theft, looking at the evidence. And the other case it was about Chinese traders exploiting uh, Malays, consumers, and so on. Both, both cases given up to the extent that people feel that this is actually common, or many people jump in by depending on which side they are on from an perspective. Coming back to your question is that given that sense of anxiety, many Malays probably felt that the system has not been beneficial to us. But how can you pro but it at least suppress the nominates? By removing them, what will we have? So the, it's, it's the uncertainty that's actually come back to on this. Given that situation, and I'm not sure whether the younger workers would actually go to abandon the system. If they abandon, would they go for, say, uh, PKR, Amana, or DAP, or they would actually go to pass? So that's passing some Thank you. Um, Trish Todd, from Um, I'm interested in your comments or thoughts about the role of the police and potentially the military here. Yeah. You, you talk about um, dissent yeah. and whether the opposition come from within the UNO yeah. or within the broader society. Yeah. And I just, it, it does seem to raise issues in yes. terms of the role of the police and potentially the military. Uh, the police in Malaysia, the military in Malaysia has been has been generally a okay, political even in 1969. So you did not see uh, a coup directly involving that. In the post riot setup, there was a National Operation Council which has representatives from the politicians, the bureaucrats, the police, and the military. The military never played a driving role. In comparison, police have been highly political, politicized, because of our co-war history. Uh, we, had a, we had this civil war from 1948 to 1960, but it was never called a civil war, it was called emergency for economic reason. If you call it a civil war, then your insurance costs would rise. So for that reason, it was, it was, it was downplayed as just emergency. But during that war, uh, the police play a major role in combating the communists. So we have a huge segment of what we call special branch. Uh, that's basically intelligence. And they spend a lot of time, uh, I mean, during those years for policing uh, the communists and the leftists, but today it's basically all the opposition. So in a normal situation like this, you have a discussion of relation politics, 
then it's very common for Malaysian participants to start looking around. So is there an SB around? SB is special branch, right? So we people do watch around to see whether they are uh, under surveillance. And in the case of Malaysian politics, uh, in 19, somewhere during Abdullah's rule, there was a proposal by a royal commission of inquiry headed by a chief judge, which proposed to set up an independent police complaint and misconduct commission, IPCMC, to regulate police. And that proposal was dropped by the government because of opposition from the police. The Prime Minister then, Abdullah Badawi, despite having a 91% majority in the parliament, did not have the political will to push through. Because it has come up to the, to the case, if you look at some accusations about the police was involved in the underground and so on, it's apparently corrupt politicians and corrupt police, uh, the institution now has, uh, the corrupt politician and the police has some sort of institutional symbiotic relationship. They need each other to survive. And so police reform becomes very difficult. And one, one of the key things I think people have overlooked is that we need not to have a unitary police force. We, sh we can learn from Australia. I mean, the Australian system that you have federal police and state police. Because then, at least, you take away, uh, you create different institutional setup to minimize politicization. But all these things are not in that area. People are so worried that I think both sides, uh, that the opposition are more critical of the police. But generally, people do not want to push it forward uh, except small numbers of activists and politicians for fear of offending the police. Yes? Yes? Hi, my name is Neil Moore. I'm from Curtin University and this is Stephen there. And I'm very interested in um, stuff that I'm happening back home. So my question to you is that as um, the younger generation, I'm very much keen to actually have a reformation, you know, just of the institutional reforms. And my question is actually the fact that whilst the youth doesn't matter if you're Malay or Chinese Indian, you know, we all want jobs, we all want the same income yeah. to an extent. But with the older generation, you know, let's say, um, for my dad, for instance, let's say he owns a business and he knows that the corruption is actually systematic. We have to pay, let's say, the uh, Port Authority or get your car with and everything. Yeah. They're still used to the system to an extent that when, so the question is, when the election comes, do you think that the older generation that is so comfortable in their position would actually vote for a change? Because the younger generation wants to change. So we, you know, we, we sit in time. So, yes, yeah, so that's just a question. Yeah. Good question. I think it's a, it's a, it's a question is that you can, you can frame it from a generation uh, divide. You can also look back at just basically um, sectoral position and divide, where he wants them to benefit or suffer from that. In, in a sense, I think the entire corrupt system is bad collectively for all of us. It blocked us from moving on. But individually, some people stand to gain. So would you let your individual, individual rationality prevailing over your collective rationality, right? Uh, it's a big question. I'm uh, not sure whether it's actually generation. Because I think sometimes uh, older people have different memory, which I may not agree. Uh, many older Malaysians like to believe that our past was fantastic. It was the, the way that we did is a deterioration from the golden days, from the good of uh, yesterday years. I'm a bit more critical because looking back at the history of 1946 and so on, I think it's just a matter of time for all this problem to catch up with this. So when many people think positively of the past, now that would lead them to reject the present. So it may not be so much of generation. What I worry really is about communion. Because I think NEP, the survival of NEP, uh, NEP as a policy has ended officially in 1990. By NEP, what I'm talking about now, the new economic policy, is a paradigm uh, of stressing, restructuring the society, or in put it very blunt way, how do you maintain uh, the Bumi Putra, the native, or more bluntly, Malay Muslim dominance. 
What's the problem with NAP? And this is where the opposition have never come, even as alternative in the past, have never come very concretely to an alternative. Because it's hard for you to please people from two ends. If you're talking too much of a reform, you're probably going to lose some labels. If you talk too little of a reform, then the non-Malays would ask and say, why should I be bothered to support you? Because there's not much change. And we are stuck in there. What's the problem with NAP? Uh, think of it as two ways. How you divide us. One, this is a lottery to get. Not everyone gets a chance to strike a lottery. I mean, it's a lottery to get that only the if you, you compare the policy differential as a lottery to get, and some people would actually get uh, a chance to be rich and so on because you're moving to Trump, then not even every moving trial has a chance. Only some people do, others don't. But if you are a poor Malay, and now I come to you and say, let's do away this policy, that's basically to say, let's give me the lottery to get you have in your hand. Would it be rational for you to throw that away? Because at least if you hope. I mean, at the end of the law, at the end of the day, what is lottery? Lottery is a scheme. Conceptually, this is what I understand as lottery. It's a scheme that 90, 90, 90, 90, 99, 99 percent of people put in their money. One percent of people draw their money, but the majority of the parties, majority of the, the, the part of the money goes to the scheme operator. Right? That's what NAP is. So you may be actually a losing end, but why would you want to give up your dream? That, that, that opportunity is that you could be the next lucky guy. But there's the other part of NAP that's actually more divisive. Consider that as priority pass. You go to bank, so that one queue move faster, because you hold a priority card. You go to airport, one queue move faster because that's business class, right? Now, that two different things are defined by your ethno-religious category. What does it make to you? You would feel that, say, instead of complaining about that, why we have such a long queue, you start comparing and say, hey, that queue, our queue move faster than theirs. Wouldn't it be in our interest to keep this queue? Now, the second implication is different from the first one. Because the first one clearly few people benefited. The second one is actually all encompassing. So I'll just give you a very clear, simple answer. Let's say I'm going to buy a house, which cost me a new house, which cost me, say, uh, 100,000 US dollar, uh, Australian dollar. And another person from the booming track at Goes to buy the same house. <coughs> he or she may enjoy 7% discount flat. And just because that we happen to come from a different area. Right. And that's the part that where you actually apply in many ways to, to make you feel that say it's actually collective. Now, instead of two levels of rationality of benefits, like collective, individual, now you actually have three levels. I mean, as a nation, you have your interest at one level. As a member of as a member of nation, you have interest at one level. As a member of an ethno religious category, you have different interests. As an individual, you have a different interest. And how do you align your interest to say, I want to change the system? And by, by saying all these things, I'm not suggesting that, okay, that the system is flawed and therefore tear it. I'm suggesting that say we need to be very, very sincere to look at what kind of a situation that we are in. Because we can't get out of this, this, this uh, crisis, this quicksand, whatsoever you might call it, by pointing finger, by thinking in a very moralistic sense, thinking that it's the other party that should be at thing. We need to come up with real alternative that can tackle the socio-economic backwardness of Malay Muslim that's more effective than state partiality. Because what 
we have in the nativist policy is basically state partiality. You have social inequality, the solution then is state partiality. But the state partiality has failed. So what's the option? The oppositions have, ref have refused to go into details because they're not sure they can actually find a solution. Yes, please. Peter Esmont, uh, member of the AWIA. Uh, the armed forces, are they involved in uh, private enterprise activities and to what extent and what sort of contracts do they get? Uh, okay, I think there are actually quite a bit of works on corruptions involving the militaries and defence contracts and so on. Uh, part of the things is because we have official secret acts and anything related to defence is one of the categories that are politically classified. And that means that if I'm going to ask around what's the contract of supply of toilet tissues in a military manra, I can't get it because that's official secrets, right? So that kind of protection would have been, would have been a hotbed for corruptions. But I'm not an expert in that, so I wouldn't well, be able to answer. Like Indonesia, Indonesia and Egypt have a... Sorry? I said that wouldn't be to the extent that Indonesia and Egypt use their forces for private enterprise. Uh, there's, a slight, there's, a, there's a difference, not slight difference. There's a difference between Malaysia and Indonesia because the Indonesian army during uh, uh, the new order has this, this theories of dual function. So one is military, the other one is political. And Malaysian, uh, Malaysian military has always been relatively apolitical. So we never gone, we have never gone that deep. The problem is about secrecies that prevent effective scrutiny from uh, parliamentarians, from the parliament, from the public, and so on. So that's that's what really holds back. Yes, please. Yes, you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nada. I'm from the Malaysian Council. Okay. Can I just take your views, actually, on since you mentioned the role on the national economy? Yeah. How do you see it different, let uh, say, from the affirmative actions uh, of affirmative policies that are practiced in Northern Ireland, for instance, or even in the US? How do you see that different than the other part of the world? I am not familiar with the one in Northern Ireland, but if you're looking at uh, uh, the US one, I think one thing that was actually framed in the language of equal opportunity. And it was meant to empower the minorities. And in the case of Malaysia, there was there are actually two arguments being used interchangeably and often our convenience. One argument is empowerment, is, is I mean social justice and so on, and that's close to equal opportunity, inclusion. The other argument is actually nativism. Let's go back and say whose ancestors was were here first. And therefore, I go back to 1946. Because uh, in 1946, when when um, when the British proposed the Malay Union for Malaya, excluding Singapore, uh, it was opposed by the Malays. And under what that matter, uh, two years later, it was replaced by the Federation of Malaya, which much restrictive citizenship requirement policy. Now, however, that victory of UMNO was immediately diluted by Cold War because of communist incidency. And so as a result, uh, UMNO was forced to go, uh, UMNO split because of uh, Dato On proposal to open up the party to accommodate the non Malays. And then later, in order to fight Dato On, UMNO went into coalitions with the Malaysian Chinese Association, and that leads to what we have today. But in the process, I think that there's a lot of uh, reluctance was argued and say that was it was in official language it was called social contract and say that you know the the opening up of citizenship is an act of mercy by the natives to the to the immigrants. And therefore the special status come in as a form of compensation, not so much because of individual socioeconomic status, but it's rather as an, as as a as a price, as a as a token of acquisitions of the nativist generosity. So that's a very different argument. I don't think you find that argument in, in America 
But uh, going beyond that, I think let's go back and say, uh, just look at the affirmative action itself. I think we need much more sincere and in-depth debate because it's not a simple question of black and white. And the country that we can perhaps look at uh, closer to us, one is Africa, South Africa, the other one is India. You have two questions uh, looking at the case like Malaysia. One is that the affirmative action is applied to favor the majority. That's one. That leads to a question. Why did we not hope for another alternative of state intervention on social economic equality? That's welfare state. Very obvious, because welfare state is colorblind. Welfare state cannot pick its uh, beneficiaries. What I mean is that welfare state would not be able, would not, would not be corrupt for partisan calculation. So for example, you can have a leftist party push into place a welfare state policy, extensive welfare state, and then a working class who would for a right wing party would still be benefited from the system, right? Because the, left, the socialist party cannot go in and say, you didn't vote for me, so I'm going to remove this from you. There's no way for you to to uh, what's the word? The agency problem did not happen at that level. You can't you can't turn a state policy for partisan benefits turning into a mechanism of partisan patronage. But in our system, yes, that's clearly the case. So you have one problem. Now why did we go for that? The reason why I'm saying that we should seriously consider about a welfare state is, 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 is this. Affirmative action makes better sense when you are taking from many to support few. However, when you are taking from few to support the many, it would make more sense for you to have a policy that covers across the board. It just, it just that was a debate that we never had. And we're further moving away from that. I'm actually not a left. I don't want to be speaking, I'm probably, I'm probably closer to the right because I believe in public choice theory. But in the case of Malaysia, I think what we really need is a, is a classical left-right debate to go back to the facet. I think that's something that we, we, need, to, we need to address it in, in honesty. That's one. Second, coming back to affirmative action itself, uh, my, my question is this. Uh, why does it work? Why, why do we go for uh, identity-based affirmative action? Because we're looking at a category and say, uh, some people are just, just disadvantaged historically. You have to compensate them. But there's also another underlying argument. When you compensate someone, the benefit flow to people who are related to that, right? That's a communal solidarity built into that argument. However, that's a part that has not worked effectively. Has it not very effective? I mean, it's poison is one way because it strengthened communal politics, but on the other hand, it has not worked so effectively. Because if you had, politically, the base of probably would be much more united. It has not happened that way. Part of the reason it has not happened that way is because people who stand to gain from that policy are not uh, preventing its abuse. Let's say we use we use a lottery ticket, the metaphor of lottery ticket, right? Because that this group of people were historically disadvantaged, and we cannot lift them up over time, so we allow them to draw a lottery ticket, so some of them for a luckier one would be able to move faster. The next question. When they have become better off, should their children be still qualified in this group? That's a question of like, should people be allowed to strike the lottery twice or three times? That's a situation that's very real, I think that in, in the Malayan society, because there are many ordinary relates who feel that we are denied from that. Because it's a minister's son, grandsons, 
a grant importance who are getting uh, state scholarships or whatever contracts that they just bypass us. Then the question is that who do you blame? Now, if you blame and say it's the unknown party states that have not executed uh, this policy faithfully for the interests of all the days Muslims of Umitra, then you force the system to respond. However, if you see it that way and say this is actually because that the Chinese, uh, you know, the Western power, the Israel, whatsoever, that's actually stopping this, that is a completely different story, right? You would affirm the system and say, well, we need to have the same policy for longer. So for me, to me, for me, the NEP is actually uh, a medication that we need to ask. If it has not worked uh, satisfactory today, is it because that this is a wrong prescription, or has it? Is it because that we have not given enough doses? And the unfortunate part is that, so we had this discussion here in a very open, direct manner, even though we may still disagree with each other at the end, right? You wouldn't hold anything against me. However, if you're going to have the discussion in Malaysia, you know well that I know well that what will happen out there, there are people who say that Wong Jin Park is instigating uh, you know, the abolitions of the Malays because that he's not grateful of what his parents have gotten from this system. That would be, what would be level against me? So my point is that for Malaysia to move forward, and because that Malays Muslims are such a majority, it was not a clear majority. Today, it is clearly a majority. We need to transform the Malay interest, Malay anxiety, Malay crisis, from a communal agenda into a national agenda. We need to take it on and say, if we don't take care of the Malay problems, no one can be taken care of effectively. It's collective government. Okay, based on that, I think there's a market opportunity for us here. We can hold all the contentious discussions between Malaysians <coughs> the Asian Research Centre and maybe get some resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time for one more question, Jim again? Sorry to be again. That's okay. I'm no asking else. this on behalf of everybody. Um, what exactly was the salary of 600 million one million alien Americans account meant to achieve? It's a good question. I mean, um, I have not, I have not kept tracks according to the answer. But it depends on the dates you're asking me. At some point, I will answer that's a donation. At other point, it's an investment. At some point, it's to combat ISIS. At other point, it's to win the election. So it all depends on what date you're asking. Maybe I'm not sure anyone else could have give a, a more uh, accurate answer to that. Yes, just one last question. Thank you very much. I have so many who have right there. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of hope after 2008 of, uh, of change in Malaysia. And uh, I think the opposition actually ramped up a lot of uh, effort uh, in, in trying to make change uh, in the 2015 election. And for me, there was a lot of hope in the middle of us, in the new generation of Malaysians. And I have to admit that the new generation of Malaysians, whether they are beneficiaries of them, are beneficiaries of the, a booming economy. And if you trace the economic development uh, after 1970 and before 1970, we can see a drastic change yeah. in the latest economy. So everybody benefited. They lifted all boats. But some, of course, did not get the benefit. But there was a lot of promise that a new generation of Malaysians would be able to, to make that change. Which change? Regime change, okay. political change, okay. political reforms, but that didn't happen, right? And uh, the sad part is that Bursi, for me, Bursi held a lot of promise because Bursi managed to garner mm -hmm. uh, support from di people from diverse backgrounds, yes. different ethnicities. Yes. But Bursi four was an exception. I went down to Kuala mm -hmm. um, to see Bursi four. Yeah. And it was basically overwhelmingly homogenous in the sense that uh, PAS uh, left Pakatan and basically Bursi was devoid of the Malay support. And then 
the way I look at it is that even the middle class, the young Malaysians, the middle class, are not highly divided, are polarized. The middle class is supposed to be the source of change, <coughs> but now it's a broken middle class, broken with extreme views on, on different issues. Yeah. So, you know, that was a big disappointment. The other thing you mentioned about institutional reforms, uh, you mentioned about the NEP and the need to go from affirmative action to need space. Uh, uh, okay. If you look at Malaysia's policy from 2009 mm -hmm. up until now, uh, the new economic model, for example, mm -hmm. right, there was a clear shift away from ethnic base mm -hmm. to need space. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about, for example, the Brick. Brick. Yeah. Bantuan Rakyat Satu Malaysia. Yeah. That was basically target, it's a direct transfer. Yeah. And it reduces all leakages. Yeah. You know, it eliminates leakages. Mm. That was not taken up very well. Somehow, it was, it was, it was politicized. It was politicized. Ah, to, okay. such a, to, to such an extent that it became a mockery. You know, some people mock as if it becomes a political tool. But I thought, as an economist, I thought that that was a fantastic way to, to basically give people direct benefits and to prevent leakages which happened in the past. That's one. Second, the idea of GSP, for example, because I work on the diversification strategy, and I know that Malaysia has been trying to diversify its economy, to diversify its revenue, and GST was one way of buffering any shocks that might have happened if there is a, you know, a, 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 a sharp drop in all prices. And it did happen. Mm. Yeah, so my question is that there's so many things that's happening, but somehow Malaysia doesn't seem to look at this sort of reform and support it and make it better. And of course there are corruption, there are leakages, there are state privileges, but the, the discussion has been shifted to such an extent that the whole system is a mockery. But I don't think that the system is a mockery because the economy is not going well on for the past few years. Uh, they just issued a super bond today or yesterday, and it, the take up rate was fantastic. So, how is it that opposition alliance, they had a window of opportunity from 2008 to 2015, they could have done so much institutional reform, get the thing right, uh, and support it, and change it, and amend it? But somehow there was a lot of politicking and that has basically, you know, eroded confidence in the economy or even the leadership. Very interesting question. So you're from? Uh, I'm Dylan Ho, I'm a research fellow at Murdoch. Uh, I'm on sabbatical leave from the School of Government. Thank you. Uh, I think I will summarize the question in three parts. One is about per se, why per se, so more than ethnic and so on. The second part is brief and uh, GST. Uh, I left economics like 20 or years ago. So I'm not sure how far I'm going to touch on. But I'll touch on the political side of it. The last one was about why the, the opposition seized the opportunity since 2008 to, institution yes. to, to introduce institutional reform. Uh, first question. I think there's a very common perception that say, uh, uh, being someone in the Brisbane team, I would first of all acknowledge it's, a, it's, it's an acknowledgement of appreciations of Brisbane uh, effort to bring relations together because what we push for is actually procedural democracy in the sense of like we're talking about rules of the game and not outcome of the game so that allows people to put aside whatever interest they have and say let's agree on something uh, coming back to per se four why was it heavily Chinese dominated uh, the, the common popular theory is of course they say past was not there so, if this hypothesis is right, then this means if past is organizing, you should see thousands of people, right? Or hundreds of thousands of people. Then look at two things. One was the anti-TPPA protest. Past was all for it. The other one was uh, the anti dual language program protest. That's to oppose the introduction to give the school the choice of whether they want to switch the uh, medium language from Malay to English and so on. And both parts were all for it. 
But what does it happen? The anti-TPPA for all its talk and its highly nationalist tone, talking about national sovereignties and so on, it draws less than 10,000. For, for DLP, was, the first one was a few less than 500, I think second time maybe 1,000. It's still small numbers, right? So I don't think it was actually passed. And it was not on the part of per se to say a queue to a single ethnic group because that doesn't work. Didn't work in our interest. So how do we explain that? I think the explanation we have to look back and say because of fragmentations of the politics. If you go back to you go back to uh, history in the forties. From, from 1955 to 2015, for that 70 years, a big part of it was actually two-party politics, Amnon and Pax. Then, uh, for a short period, it has Smangan 46, and then later, Kaadilan. And Kaadilan really became a force after 2008. It was not after 1999. I think that was a minor party. So by 2014, by 2008 onward, you have three Malay parties, perhaps competing from the neighbors, a shift from a, to a bipartisan state in the politics. 2014, you have first the split of PKR, which did not bring about a new party because uh, the Salaman Chief Minister, Khalid Brahim, was a real danger. But that caused a split in parts. So by 2015, you have four parties, Amana. Now, it was so clear cut that because of 1MDB, Amnon is going to split sooner or later. That's five party. If you count DAP that has been working very hard since 2008, or before 2008, again, they support the sixth party. <coughs> These are probably the sixth party going to nom dominate the national political scenes, not just the main. Because all the non-Malay uh, non uh, VA parties can basically go to museums in, you know, in the matters of years. But an uh, ordinary Malay probably have not, would not do what the political scientists do and count the numbers of party. But I'm quite sure that just like birds do not need to know about aerodynamics, they know how to fly, right? People would actually feel that something different from the system is, is disorientation. Because no one's shown to you where you go. And the simplest way to interpret all this is to say there's too much politics. We do not have a simple answer. In other words, we have trouble to deal with political pluralism. And that's actually more so in the Malay community, especially in the Malay speaking Malay community. Right? I think that's the reason why we're still few to call out. Because when Mahathi came to the streets and so on, um, and Brazil was calling for Najib, I think that's one clear uncertainty was that what if, if there's overwhelm of Malay support? Najib probably would, I'm not with force to would force to do something on that. That would it cause a split of Amdo. And there are some things that we are not prepared ideologically. We are all prepared to say Najib must go out, but there is no serious discussion about how do we manage the transition. So I think that's, that's the reason why Brazil did not get much of support uh, from the police. Now, the second question is about uh, BRIM and GST. I think BRIM, as you say, is a, is a, a form of uh, direct transfer, cash. And, now, and that was probably a response to what the Pakatan state had been doing at the state level, who were then copying from Singapore. Right? So what's the problem with that? It's because in the case of Pakatan state government, they cut down their linkages to provide for the money. In the case of federal government, the linkages were not really cut down because you have to get it back from GST and so on. So it's like robbing you from one hand and giving you back another hand. And so that doesn't come well. And the reason why it was politicized, also when you look back at how Green was given, was normally given to the uh, politicians, often ministers or whatsoever, in the sense that this is actually policy would buy. So that's part of it that's come back to it. But I think the ultimate questions here, if you want to have, we really need to talk about not cash and out. By talking about how do we improve our public goods so much so that the poorer segment of the society, regardless of the ethnicities and faith, can actually benefit. I think that's a debate that we do not have.
Now, the question coming back to institutional reform. I think we should recognize that institutional reform has been pushed for the opposition state. For example, Islam, uh, State Assembly under uh, speaker, former Speaker Ting Chang Ki actually introduced so many things that uh, members of the state government, uh, I mean, members of the ruling coalition, bureaucrats were all subject to scrutiny in, in the House. Uh, the system, they even appoint uh, Amnu, Amnu leader, they wanted to appoint Amnu leader under the current speaker, they wanted to appoint Amnu leader as opposition leader and also the uh, chairman of the Private Account Committee. And was rejected because Amnu did not want to play the role. In the case of Penang, we actually pushed for local elections. But uh, the election commission rejected it and we lost our constitutional challenge in the court. So there's a lot of things why we are not pushing it it's because that our federal system is heavily centralized. And that goes back to 1946 because federalism was introduced as an alternative to the uni unitary states of the Union. Union. was not introduced because we want to accommodate changes over major fault lines, as mean between the Malays, non-Malays and Muslim, non-Muslim, but rather to preserve Malay state which were effectively democracies. So I think there's a lot of questions we need. We need in much more deeper and sincere debates. So I'm very happy to, to have the chance to exchange ideas with not just our Australian friends, but Malaysian friends here, because I think these are debates that we probably may, don't have a chance to talk enough about it back. Great. Well, thank you for giving us the opportunity to hear that today. It's been a great presentation. I know we've gone a little bit over time. I think the fact that no one has led other than those people who told me beforehand they had other meetings at some point during your talk has left because it's been really stimulating and there have been great questions too. So thank you for your presence and your contributions, but especially thanks to Dr. Wong Ching White.